Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Horse Center this beautiful Monday. It is great to be back, and we have such an exciting show for you tonight. I'm Wild Jamie. With me is the amazing Swiss Army Sean, my wonderful co-host, and our guest tonight is none other than the most winning female trainer of all time. No big deal. We bring you only the best here on Horse Center, and that is Kathleen O'Connell. Uh-oh. Something must have happened. She'll be right back, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> My guest tonight is Swiss Army Sean. Sean, tell us. Yeah, about yeah. <laughs> I'm not the all time winningest female trainer at all. <laughs> no, not even close. Not even, a win not even a winning trainer. I haven't gotten one. So. And not even a female, unless you're hiding something from me. So. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about Penn National. Well, oh, wait, here she comes. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, hold on. You're muted. Can you unmute yourself? For, for, oh, there. Perfect. Okay. We are back. Oh, well, you missed my introduction of you where I explained to everyone that you're a very big deal. You're the most winning female trainer of all time. So welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much for being here. You are a very busy person. As I was texting you to set this up, I was shocked by how much you were traveling up and down, had all kinds of things going on, little catastrophes like what happened down in South Florida a few months ago with the crazy amounts of rain and just handling it all and keeping it all together. So good on you for being so organized and busy. <laughs> well, it's important to be organized, so... And what happened in South Florida was truly biblical. I mean, if you stop and think, the airport was closed for two or three days. So that's a tremendous amount of rain in a short period of time. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. Yeah, the picture you sent me was shocking, <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. <laughs> okay, well, you have such an interesting story, and I am so excited to pick your brain about this. But as you mentioned before we went live, you do not come from a racing family. So to come from basically nowhere and to achieve this kind of success is absolutely monumental. So tell us a little bit about how you got started in racing. Well, it it's kind of odd because it was, you know, the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, I, actually, I had no plan on going in horse racing. I had always been with horses my whole life as far as I was very involved with 4-H and was the usual horse crazy girl growing up. But I mean, I grew up in Detroit City and my father was a Detroit policeman for 25 years. And he also worked for the state of Michigan for another 10 years and police work after that. So to just get bit by the horse bug, I had actually planned on going to veterinarian school. And even though I graduated you know, with National Honor Society and a 3.8. At that point in time, they only took two or three girls a year. So I was like so devastated because I didn't get accepted in vet school that I was going to go do something with the horses until I figured out exactly what I was going to do. And actually, even though I had worked in 4-H and with show horses, I only lived like six miles from DRC. And you know, the next thing I knew, I was at DRC and, you know, I didn't know anything about walking hats or anything. I just thought I was whole, just enthralled with the whole deal that you could actually make a living doing something that you really liked. And, you know, one thing led to another. And I feel very blessed that I was surrounded and supported by good people and had a very good foundation that, you know, the racetrack is a great place. I mean, there's no such thing as unemployment on the racetrack for a willing worker. And right. if you learn, there's usually more than enough people that take interest and I'll help you. So, you know, I walked hats. They found out I could ride. I, you know, was riding the pony, doing some pony work. And, you know, after showing horses, which I never jumped, but I did show like three gated horses and Arabians and Morgans. And I thought, my God, how tough is this? You go in a circle. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing to it. And I had always loved the young horses and the babies. I, I had broke horses already. So, you know, when I got the 
invite to, oh, you want to go to Ocala and break horses and ride babies and ride thoroughbreds? I'm there like, yeah, I'm game. And get out of the winter in Detroit where, you know, sure. been in snow my whole life. And like I say, I just feel very blessed. Uh, you know, uh, when I came on the racetrack, you know, I worked for a guy that just had a few horses. That he really didn't need me. He got me hooked up with a big outfit. That outfit happened to be Mike Basso's Sugar Hill Farms of Ocala. Wow. Armstrong was a jockey that ran the farm. Bill Cole trained for him. And like I say, one thing led to another, and I ended up in Ocala. And I mean, it was a beautiful farm and great working place and, you know, great people to be around. They treated me like family, like, you know, it, it could have ended up so much worse, especially nowadays. You think of everything that's going on. Yeah. But uh, like I say, I, I was truly blessed. And, you know, I broke horses. I galloped. I went back to Detroit and galloped horses for years. And actually, Billy Mott and me are very good friends. He was in Detroit galloping. We galloped together. And a lot of great horsemen come out of Detroit. A lot yeah. of good horsemen. That's true. So many. We've actually had many of them on this show, right? Like Terry Houghton. Isn't that right, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. PD rode for me, uh, coming off so many injuries. And, you know, sure. he's a great guy and a great person. His father was a good outrider at Detroit. Like mm -hmm. I say, there's just so many good horsemen that were in Detroit. Yes. And I just love you actually brought up this tidbit before we went live as well. But um, I think it's so funny that one of your first licenses you got on the track listed you as pony boy because the assumption is just anyone doing that job is going to be a man. So we don't need a pony girl category or a pony person. It's just pony boy. <laughs> no box to check back then, but pony boy. You were a pony boy or an ex boy or a hot walker or that was the only boxes to check. Right. Oh, that's just a testament to how many barriers you have broken as a woman in this field, which is just incredible. All right. Well, this is jumping forward big time. But I had also told you before we went live that I just got off the phone with jockey Antonio Gallardo because you guys have such a close working relationship. And I mean, he just talked my ear off on all the things that you have done for him, both professionally, just as a friend. And also, um, I mean, personally as a friend, but also professionally, he's like, she always gives the best advice. She's so smart when it comes to horses. She's so smart about where you should be going and what you should be doing. And he credits you and your advice to completely changing his career. Cause he was really struggling at one point when he first came to the United States. And it was your suggestion that he go to Tampa and then come back to Tampa after he had a little bit of success. And I mean, as we know, he has absolutely skyrocketed since then. So he has only wonderful things to say about you. And he asked me to bring up the fact that apparently one day at Calder, um, he was there riding some horses and he was supposed to go to Gulfstream and something happened where your rider got injured. And you basically yeah. called him last minute, like, Antonio, you got to stay here. You got to ride my horses. And it ended up being a record breaking day. Tell us about that. It was, you know, the highs and the lows of the business. You know, Eduardo Nunes has rode for me for years and certainly has over hundreds of winners for me and was definitely one of my go-to riders. And uh, unfortunately, on Stallion Stakes Day, uh, he was injured and it was on another horse of mine. You know, it's very difficult sometimes for young horses to navigate the turf course because they're, you don't get to practice on it or breeze on it or gallop on it. Yeah. And this filly was a little quirky and it was like, she never made the turn. She never made the turn. And, you know, he catapulted pretty hard into the fence, came off and uh, hit his head. And of course they didn't want him to ride. And I had the stallion stakes coming up and Antonio, it, it was crazy at that time. I can't even tell you how crazy it was because both Gulfstream and Calder were running. And it was very hard as a trainer and a jockey to navigate the waters. So in other words, you know, some of them would be 
riding the first few races at Gulfstream, then come back to Calder. Some would be riding at Calder, then go to Gulfstream. And I guarantee you, Jamie, there was more speeding tickets in that year for, <laughs> you know, trying to make the race and trying to, you know, keep all the clients happy. And it was very difficult for them, especially because, like, say you were wanting to commit to ride and then some of your good horses got in a, a race that you might not be able to make at the other place then you're making somebody angry and mad by taking off theirs and whatever but I mean I was almost in a panic when they said he couldn't ride because everybody that I had a comfort level with or good communication with was taken and I I called him and I said Antonio you you've you've got to ride you you've just got to ride and you know he ended up I'm sure making somebody else angry and unhappy and he stayed and both horses won the stallion stakes and wow. you know he had a great day we won two stallion stakes in an undercard race wow. and you know he you know he's a very smart rider he's a good student of the game you know he can give you feedback on a horse, which, you know, as a trainer, I think is very, very important. Even, you know, I gallop for years. Sometimes they're different in the afternoon than they are in the morning. And it takes the communication of everybody to make it all work. And he always was a good communicator and he was good on the young horses. So it turned out to be a good day and everything. And yeah, I did you know, talk him into going to Tampa because I thought it would be a great place. He had a young family come, you know, I'm sure it's a lot better atmosphere in Tampa to raise children than, you know, Miami. And, you know, the rest was just history, but I almost had to laugh because the first year, you know, he ended up like fifth or fourth in the standing. And, when it was coming to Tampa time, he goes, well, I don't know if I'm going back. I go, Antonio, are you crazy? Do you know how many people would don't even do that good the first year they come here? Now yeah. you've got your foot in the door and, you know, and he came back and, you know, he ended up, that was one of his first years as leading rider. Right. Yeah. Yes. Very cool. Well, that was some great advice. <laughs> so Kath, Kathleen, you said about how your career started. Um, your career started in 1981, and you didn't always start off very successful, but you were winning. When did you know, not only am I going to be a trainer, but I'm going to be a, well, obviously the most successful female trainer? Well, I mean, I never set out to break records or be the most successful trainer. I just wanted to be a good trainer and have a good horses and good clients. And, you know, so many times over the years, you know, somebody would interview and say, oh, what's your greatest accomplishment? The stallion stakes or you got to run in the Derby or you went to the Breeders' Cup. And I said, no, I said, I think my biggest accomplishment for myself is so many years that we had uh, horses that made over a million, that we win almost 100 races a year that we weren't a fly-by-night operation. I mean, we continued year after year after year. I mean, my first license on the racetrack was in 1970, and I started walking hats, I ponied, I galloped, and it wasn't until 81 I began to realize that, you know, I wouldn't be able to gallop my whole life because, you know, you get older, and I had back problems. I was in a very bad car accident in Detroit, and... Uh, you know, it, you just know you're not going to do that. But because I love the horses and love the business, I, you know, wanted to train. And like I say, I do love the developing of the young horses. Most people know I don't claim very much. I'm not a claiming, shaking, moving trainer. Uh, but like I say, we all have the things that we like that we excel in. And it's part of the reason, what's the reason you don't, care for the claiming game well i just think you know the claiming unless you claim a horse early in its life or career you know pretty much i would hope that at least the horse is worth what you claimed it for i think it's a very uh you know it can be very shaky business as far as uh having them worth what they're claimed for and you know some people that want to get in the game think oh I'm, I've saved up 
you know, six thousand or eight thousand dollars, I'm going to claim a horse for five thousand. Well, when they're already at the bottom someplace, there's no place to go, you know, to make it easier on the horse if you need to. So, like I say, to me, it's just harder to navigate. And I've always been more in tune with the younger horses and the developing and seeing them go from, you know, being the awkward kid in the class to, you know, finally putting it all together. At what point did you realize that you might become the winningest trainer, uh, female trainer? Well, it really wasn't until uh, maybe last December or something that they said, you know, you're, uh, you're closing the gap on Kim Hammond. I never raced at Fairmont. I, you know, I really don't know anything and I, about the people out there. Uh, and I just, you know, never really realized it. You know, me coming from where I came from, it was accomplishment the first time I won a thousand races. And then, you know, 1500 races was with Antonio Gallardo. The thousandth race was with Eddie Nunes, who rode for me for years and was the winningest jockey at Calder before they closed down. And then my 2000th race was at Delaware with a first time starter baby with Hector Diaz. And then the record breaker, of course, was with Antonio. So all those were very, very special moments and very special. But like I say, it wasn't like I, I set out to, to do that. Talk about the emotions when that finally happened. Well, the emotions were running high for like two weeks. And I thought my whole help and crew was going to have to go and detox because they drank when we lost. <laughs> they drank. We got DQ. They drank when we won. <laughs> they drank when we tied. So it's a good thing it happened. <laughs> and now you're only 99 wins away from 2,500. So you're just yeah. knocking off the milestone. Well, we hope we stay healthy and and can do it. That's awesome. So obviously your success. You know, you're so humble. You credit everyone else who's part of your team, which that certainly is a piece of the picture. But you yourself have a lot of great qualities in order to get there. So what do you think makes you a good trainer? Well, I can't suggest it's the life for everybody because in order to be successful, I think there's a lot of sacrifice. There was a, a lot of sacrifice of not spending time with my own family. I credit people like Antonio or any trainer that's in the business that has children and a family to raise because it is a very difficult business and it's a very emotional business as far as ups and downs go. So I think there's a lot of sacrifice involved in it. Gotcha. So what is the hardest part of your job as a trainer? The hardest part of my job as a trainer, I think is, you know, you feel a responsibility in a way for everybody's happiness to make the horses shine, to make them. And, you know, sometimes they're going to get injured. Sometimes they're going to get setbacks. Sometimes they don't get in the proper race. And, you know, it, it, like I say, it's a very emotional thing. It, it's, it's hard to explain, but you know, it's like, there's so much that people don't realize to training. Like, it's the nutrition, the vaccines, the keeping up with the horse health. It, you know, it's not just only the conditioning. It's, you know, like you're raising kids practically. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> and they're, you know, they learn at different rates. You know, I mean, I know anybody that has children knows that you can have three, three of them in the same house. At, treat them the same, do the same thing, and they all come out different. So it's like, it's like navigating the waters to get them to do what they should do, and also get them to enjoy what they do because they're more productive. Sure. And what is the best part of your job? Smelling horseshit every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have unique taste. <laughs> I think, you know, I always used to laugh and say, you know, a racetrack, once you enter the gates, is 
place. And I think it filters out a lot of the problems of the world and, you know, can focus on what we need to focus on. And it's really a good environment in a lot of ways. Well, and I always laugh and say the fence is to keep us in and not to keep people out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Touche. Well, I love what you said before we went live about how the racetrack is a family. And, you know, you just mentioned all of these people who you have been working with for literally decades who have just, you know, become such a part of your operation and such a part of your family. Like you said, I mean, I think that's beautiful. What about well, the comparison? Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, what about the comparison with horses, business, the rules, the racing from 1981 when you got into it to 2023? How is all that different now? Well, I think it's got a lot more complicated, just like the world has got a lot more complicated. And I'm not so sure it's good. I think anybody that's truly involved in the sport has a, a penchant and a big care about the horse. And I think we're not perceived in the best way. And I think I blame ourselves for not policing our own business and the way we do things to the fact of where it's gotten today. Absolutely. I actually had a back and forth with a person that commented on our page and had wanted nothing to do with horse racing and kept going at the horse. And I told him, please come to the track with us and we will show you the part of the sport and what you think is true is not true at all. But they just would not give me that chance. And it's bad because I think no matter what, whether it's the horse business or the backside or whatever, everybody has to have an open mind because they don't know, you know, they don't know the hours that people spend with horses. They don't know, you know, we have Beamer blankets and uh, blankets and magnetic blankets. You know, they're like spoiled athletes. We have, you know, the all you can eat carrot fridge that gets <laughs> up every day. We have sweet potatoes once a week. I, you know, it's like, I don't know why people just get it in their mind and then block it else out yeah no kidding especially your horses i have to say because i go out there and i photograph in the morning sometimes your horses are very photogenic they look awesome <laughs> so whatever you're doing it's definitely working <laughs> well thank you very much i'm kind of anal about my feed program also you know it, it paid off over the years you know i mr frank trained for until he passed away and uh the family got out of the business and that's what i value is my long time i trained for gilbert campbell for over 30 years i'm training for his wife now he passed away and like i say a lot of my clients are are long time clients wow that is incredible and kathleen we know that you travel everywhere racing these horses but we've got a new invitation for you terry hay says when are you sending some horses to golden gate fields <laughs> oh my <laughs> that's too far too yeah far. <laughs> that's I, quite I, a trip <laughs> you know been speak at miami and then go 10 days to new jersey and the same way when i flip flop to tampa and i mean that's hard enough because like i say it, just a business you have to stay on top of a lot change week to week and, you know the thing about being up north that enabled me like the year i had lady shipment i had the philly free to fly she won seven or eight in a row in three different states uh, so like i say it gives you a alternative and you know a choice of where to run and where to make the horse shine the best for your owner yeah. So you have been in some big races, the biggest of the big, the Kentucky Derby, the Breeders' Cup. How did it feel when you got there? I mean, I'm sure that when you started, you never imagined yourself being on that type of stage with those kinds of horses. What was that uh, feeling like? Like, like I say, it was uh, an honor even to make it that far to the Derby. You know, I wish we could have done better. We, you know, drew the 20 post and you know, it's just a lot of things, a lot of things factor into that race. 
But, you know, the Breeders' Cup, even running second with Lady Shipman, I mean, I was so proud of her, a three-year-old against older males because they didn't have any other classification where I could have run in short and on the turf. So, like I say, to me, it was, you know, it was huge. And, you know, it's truly a, a great experience. Yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> Are there any tracks on your bucket list that you would like to check out at least once with your horses? Well, I would like to go to Ireland and I would like to go there because my grandfather was from Ireland. He lived in County Clare and, you know, one day I'd like to make it over there. Oh, very cool. We haven't had that answer before, Sean. <laughs> no, I don't think so. So also, how many, how many more years do you think you want to trade? I'll train as long as I feel I'm healthy and but and you know I can still do it the way I do it and you know it's I'm not uh, I, I can't do it any other way I mean I know I beat myself up on airplanes I drive here and there but like the only way I know to do it. So what is your typical day like? It doesn't sound like you really have a typical day because like you said, you got to be here, there and everywhere. But so, if you had to sum it up. <laughs> well, they all start early. I wake up at three o'clock. Don't usually need an alarm. And I usually like to be to the barn by quarter, or especially at Miami because the racetrack opens at five. Wow. And then, you know, it's just getting all the horses out and constantly bikes and, you know, going through the book to make sure that you didn't miss any entries and and then the next thing you know it's time to go to the races and you know it just runs a, a, like a continuous wheel yeah i bet well we have a question here from one of our viewers grandma horse racing she has a theory that women work better with fillies and mares whether it's jockeys, trainers, whatever, do you think that you have a special touch with fillies and mares that maybe a male might not? Well, I I think women, some women communicate with horses better. I wouldn't say all of them, but I mean, they have gentler hands, you know, as far as riding, maybe gentler as far as grooming, maybe taking that extra minute or two to put the bridle on. But, you know, I also have some guys that work for me that are very nice that, you know, you walk by the stall, they're singing to them, you know, they're doing everything they can to make them happy. And they they do it, you know, because they love it. You know, I've been blessed as far as, you know, I've had a lot of people that's worked for, me for a lot of years, I have a lot of even seasonal people that come back to Tampa you know, and I just feel very, very lucky that I have them. So I uh, looked up the stats. They're pretty similar with the, the Phillies. You're 15% winning percentage, 42 in the money males. You're 14 and 39%. So a little bit better with the females. Yeah. Maybe something to it. <laughs> so what would your advice be to someone young who, especially someone who doesn't come from a racing family like yourself, what would you tell them in order to get started in this business and achieve the success like you've had? Well, you have to have perseverance and I truly believe you have to have a passion for anything you do, but especially this business. And you have to stay grounded because you do good and you do bad. You know, I remember one time an old guy that I galloped for, you know, he was a great guy and he'd, he'd say, you got your trainer's license. Do you wear baseball hats? I go, no. He goes, you got to start wearing a baseball hat. I go, why do I have to start wearing a baseball hat? He goes, you know, they got them expandable things in the back. When you think you've done everything right and you're really smart, you can let it out. And when everything goes wrong, you know, just put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. I like that advice. <laughs> So what else do you do for when, when you have time outside the track? Um, <laughs> what have you, what do you do for fun? I am very consumed by the horses. And other than that, I do like to kayak. I do like to canoe. 
I am blessed enough to have a house on Lake Tarpon in Tampa. So it's like drag the boat in the water and get away from everybody and everything. And it's very quiet and very, very peaceful. Wow, I love that. Oh, okay. Sorry, my sound kind of cut out for a minute there. I'm like, am I still here? <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit about your favorite horse. I know it's like children. It's hard to pick one, but if you had to pick one. Oh, it would be hard favorite horse because there's just so many that have brought me to places where... You know, I didn't think I would be or end up. It's, you know, very difficult. But, you know, the horse, there was a horse named Modern Messy that really got me noticed at, uh, before I got stalls in 1990 at uh, Calder. I uh, shipped 36 times from Tampa. And it, it was a long trip. It's 286 miles, no matter how you go, Alligator Alley the turnpike or whatever. And she would come off the, the trailer and she would be bucking and playing and just, it was amazing how she shipped, just amazing. Wow. And, you know, so many people had seen me leading her off the van. And I mean, here's this big gray filly and she's squealing and, you know, playing coming off a trailer after going 286 miles. And she had a, a very good record. And she ended up, uh, actually, I went right up the ladder with her. And the owner had sold her to uh, somebody at Calder. And all they kept saying was, oh, she won't have to van. She won't have to do this and that. And she's going to do so much better. And she never won another race. Oh, <laughs> well, there you, know, you go. <laughs> And, you know, because I had run her so much, I was able to get stalls there. And I guess, you know, the horse that got me my first big horse that made a million dollars was Blazing Sword. Right. And yes. that for 9-11. So, I mean, it took me all over the country as far as, I mean, we raced in Ohio. We finished second to uh, Baffert's Horse Wild Remington Derby. We ran third in the Hollywood Gold Cup. Uh, you know, we were went all over, and he was just a super nice horse. Yeah. I mean, you've had so many nice horses. Watch Me Go, of course, Lady Shipman, Blazing Sword, Well Defined. Oh, just so many. It's incredible, the career that you've had. But we do have a question from one of our viewers here, Fred. Hey, Fred. Fred likes to come to Tampa and watch you, so I got to meet him there. Just tuning in, would like to hear Kathleen's opinion on safety of synthetic tracks versus dirt. So I know that's a big topic right now. It's been all over horse racing Twitter, which you probably don't have time for Twitter, but. <laughs> I've got uh, 38,000 emails I haven't read yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got a new world record. That's incredible. Uh, I think so. But uh, I'm not a big fan myself of synthetic surfaces. I think it's difficult on a horse. I think it's, you know, I, I know they're trying to do the right thing as far as a, a good safe surface, uh, but I find it's a difficult surface for young horses, especially. I think it's because their bones and their skeletal system isn't as mature. I find less problems with the older horses I run on the synthetic. But I myself am not a big fan of the synthetic. Okay. And I, I think the synthetic track versus dirt versus turf, I think it's all a very personal thing. But like I say, that's just my own opinion from the synthetic tracks that I've raced on and trained on. What about, that was my next question. Do you think turf's safer than dirt? Well, I think a well-maintained dirt course, it, there's not a problem with it. You know, I think in the 30 years I was at Calder, I had, you know, very insignificant injuries. I, I thought it was a very well-maintained track. Camp Bay is another sand, bay, you know, very well-maintained track and put in. And I think there's an art to it. And there's a, 
to keeping up the tracks. Uh, I know even when I was galloping in Ocala, the very first year I went down there, you know, the two people that maintained that track, it was three quarters of a mile and it was a sand track. They were very, very precise. They, there were only two people that drug the track. They went from inside to outside, some days outside to inside. I, I mean, I just think there's an art to it. And I think the big problem nowadays with a lot of the tracks is, you know, the help is a problem. And I think it takes special people to drive a tractor the right way. And people, that, you know, probably need, I don't know. I'm sure there's no tractor driving school nowadays, but I mean, I think that's what it takes. Something, somebody that has a lot of experience to pass on to somebody else. Not, we need six tractor drivers. And if you have a driver's license, hey, you're in. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something to that. Like with the Santa Anita debacle that happened a few years ago, it was like the main maintenance guy retired right and then that's when everything started cropping up like that experience really plays a big role in how these tracks are maintained i think it does too and i mean even when you are maintaining a track i there's a lot of factors into it there's the weather there's you know there's a lot of things but it's got to be somebody that's knowledgeable that's skilled that's had it and like like i say i don't know you know there was guys that Calder that were there for years and years and years when I was there, you know, and they really were, took a lot of pride in everything being perfect. Sure. Yeah. Well, we've got a comment here from Willie Martinez. KO, one of the best around. She's always been such a great horseman. Congrats on your latest milestone. Well deserved. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, we are already well over the 30 minutes. So, Sean, do you have anything else before we let her go? No, I think that's it. Obviously, congrats on all your achievements and um, can't wait to get to 2,500 and continue your success. Hey, 3,000 as well. I don't know. I'm getting a little long. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love it. Once again, we just thank you so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy, busy schedule. And if you're waking up at three, this is probably well past your bedtime. So thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you guys very much. It's been nice talking to everybody. Thank yes, you. have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye. Wow, 3 a.m., Sean. I know. You know, <laughs> I told you this, you know, the first day I did that with, uh, with Pimico for the Preakness week on Thursday, I was like out of bed and I was like, I can see why they do this. This is exciting. But then Friday you do it and you're like, okay, now I'm repeating the. Now I got a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah, so, no, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's like anything else. It was, it was easy when it was new, like the first day when I didn't know. And then it's like, okay, now it's a little bit harder, but yeah, hey. I, yeah. It, it does take the, you got to if you enjoy what you're doing, it does help getting up for sure. Right. And clearly. Just trust me, I'm popping out of bed. Uh-oh. I don't know if it's me or if it's Sean. I'm going to keep going. Somebody just stopped. All right. Well, everyone, um, hopefully I'm still here. I don't know whose internet went out, if it's mine or it's Sean's. But we've got a comment here from Terry Hay, another wonderful show. Well, Terry, let me just say. You did a fabulous job filling in again last week. So we appreciate you and you are so amazing. And we are so lucky to have you be a part of the team. Um, Sean, are you here or are you not here? Uh, if, if you guys, oh, here we go. If you guys can hear me, if I'm still here, can someone please comment? Because <laughs> my internet has been acting a little flaky lately. Oh. Okay, I think I'm still here. I think Sean is the problem because he just disappeared. Grandma Horse Racing says, love this lady. Thanks again, HRT team. Love what you do. Thank you so much, Grandma Horse Racing. We really appreciate all of your support. Okay, all right. There you go. I was like, I don't know if it's me or Sean because he's just gone. <laughs> like, I didn't know neither. I looked at you and you were frozen and I was like, okay, maybe we lost Jamie. And then all of a sudden both screens were spinning and I was like, oh, okay. crap, I got to get back in there. <laughs> I know. I was like, someone... Give me a sign. Am I still here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, Sean, if you wouldn't mind, just give us a quick little thing. I know that you were at Penn National last weekend. It looked super amazing. It looked like you had tons of fun. So just let us, you know, tell us a little bit. Yeah, about it was great. Again, I did have to wake up. When I wake up a little before five to be there by six thirty, um, but again, this is what I was saying before I was cut out. If you really enjoy what you're doing, you are willing to get up because, right? You know, my office job that I had, I wouldn't have felt good every time I got up. I didn't feel good about that. Right. Feel good about that. So uh, yeah, got there. Um, Aaron and the whole staff at Penn National was gracious enough to help. You know, I got to see Tyler, um, all the people. Aaron McClellan, um, John Connor. And then I met other people, Brandon Culp, all kinds of people in the morning. Martina. Uh, Martina. I did not meet Martina in the morning, but I did. So she raced and raced too. So I yelled at her on the track to get a picture. And then uh, she came up to me later in the night because she hung out for the races. So that was great. Um, so, and I actually got noticed too by a couple of fans from okay. the show. So we're, 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 mm -hmm. we're branching out a little bit and appreciate them. That. Got to meet a couple of our listeners. And then, uh, yeah, it was good day in the morning, good day at night. So, and then we got to go up in the, uh, my brother came later too. So we got to go up in the, uh, chart caller's office, um, John Miller and, and Marie Clay, um, and visit, watch that too. I've never seen that process. That is very cool. Awesome. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Well, what else have we got going on, Sean? So tomorrow, I'm sure Terry and Rich will be back. It's Tuesday, so they'll be doing parks again. So check that out. That's usually around 12.30 p.m. Eastern. And then tomorrow night, we have one Matt Kintz. Yes. And trainer, right? Yes, he's a trainer. Um, yes, I'm, yeah. Matt thought that he was in, like, mid-July for some reason. So Willie stopped by his barn this morning and was like, hey, are you ready for the show? He's like, I mean, not really. I got time. And Willie's like, yeah, you got like 12 hours. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, now he's all situated. Everything's good. But yeah, I was like, oh, that's scary. Okay. Glad that we're all and on the same page. <laughs> and then Wednesday, we have another trainer, correct? No, it's actually Agent Steve Hayes. It's Agent. Okay. Yes. There we go. Agent he's been Steve. a jockey's agent for years. And he's been at a bunch of different tracks. So that should be a fun Who topic. does he represent currently, if you know? Currently, he has Willie and Scott Spieth. There you go. Well, then you would know Willie. <laughs> well, and Scott just won that big race today. Yes, the yes. Tom Ridge Stakes. So. Right. And look at this. I was not even aware of this. I was sleeping because I worked last night. Rich hit two pick fours today. One paid over $650. Okay. Round of applause, Rich. And see, that's what you can get if you tune in and watch some of the handicapping shows that we have. There we go. Yeah, you don't have to pay for anything. You just come to our YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe, build us up a little bit, and we give out picks for, or they give out picks for free. Yeah, not us. Get you we something. Mean, we don't give yeah, out Yeah, no, anything. no. I mean, I, I put my pen picks out there on Friday. They It was a lot of favorites, so it was hard to make any kind of money. But yeah. I don't think people want my picks, so. <laughs> <laughs> have you bet your money yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. Yeah, see, see. <laughs> I'm a failure. What? It once you start though, once busy. you start, once you start though, then then you'll keep talking about betting. So okay, touche, touche. I'm, <laughs> I'm just gonna send Rich all of my money. Be like, turn this into six hundred and fifty dollars, please, and thank you. <laughs> yeah, wish somebody would do that for me. Definitely. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Wonderful. Well, as Sean said, please like, subscribe, follow, share, all that good stuff. That helps us to help you. So we really appreciate you tuning in here at Horse Racing Today. And we hope that we will see you soon. One place we know we will see you if you are following Rich's Picks is in the... Winner Circle. The Winner Circle. Good night, everyone.